So thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Matt larsen -Dor. I'm the CEO of uh, the Mammal Society, who are the hosts of this webinar today. And this is the last in a series of free webinars that we've been running for National Mammal Week, uh, which has been running since Monday. Uh, so just the weekend to go now uh, of National Mammal Week, and our theme this week has been Mammal Connections. And that's uh, mammal connections in two ways, uh, the connections that mammals have with other aspects of ecosystems, so their really important ecological role, um, but then also the connections that mammals have with people in different walks of life, with different interests. So we've been looking at different ways that mammals influence our lives um, and uh, for different people throughout the week, um, starting with schools on Monday and going through artists um, and scientists and conservationists. Um, and today we're focusing on wildlife photography, uh, which is a really fantastic subject uh, for the theme, but also I think generally for anyone who's interested um, in mammal conservation. A lot of our uh, local recorders are also keen wildlife photographers. And what we're hoping is that a number of wildlife photographers can be keen wildlife recorders at the same time, because sometimes they're the ones with the patients and the insight into those landscapes uh, to be able to capture our elusive mammals. Um, so we've got some fantastic speakers uh, to talk to this theme today. Um, I'm really delighted to be able to introduce uh, Susan Young, wildlife photographer and author and Mammal Society committee member, and also Danny Connor, wildlife photographer and filmmaker and Mammal Society's newest ambassador. Uh, so I'll pass over to Susan very shortly. Um, she'll give um, some of her thoughts on how we can be responsible wildlife photographers and then we'll pass on to Danny for some personal perspectives on that as a photographer in the field um, and then we'll have time at the end for questions so as the speakers are talking please feel free to log your questions um, in the Q&A box so use the chat to introduce yourself to share your thoughts to share your project links anything that you'd like um, people in the webinar to see uh, but if you've got a question for the panellists, please put it into the Q&A box and you'll find the link for that um, in your Zoom panel. I'll try and pick any up from the chat if people can't uh, access the Q&A box for some reason, um, but you should be able to, uh, to use that there. Um, I'll make sure that you can see the questions that have already been answered. Um, and therefore, if there's a question that you want to know the answer to that's already been asked, no need to ask it again, just upvote that question. And that way we'll be able to prioritize at the end and make the best use of time. So without further ado, I'm just gonna introduce, uh, just gonna say a few words actually about um, the Mammal Society for those uh, who might be less familiar with our work. And then I'll pass over to our first speaker. So the Mammal Society is a UK conservation organization. Um, we work for a future in which sustainable mammal populations thrive as part of healthy and diverse ecosystems benefiting people and nature across the British Isles and Ireland. Uh, we've been going for 70 years. Um, next year is our 70th anniversary um, and uh, we do loads of work to uh, build up better understanding of mammal populations and conservation issues and to inform mammal conservation with science. We work in three ways, so our mission is threefold. We work to ensure a bright future for mammals in the British Isles and Ireland by inspiring, inspiring, informing, supporting and enhancing conservation projects and policies that protect and restore native mammal populations and their habitats. We also work with people. We empower conservationists, students, citizen scientists and nature champions to play a key role in mammal conservation now and in the future through providing training, resources and survey activations for them to get involved in. And then finally, we seek to build public awareness of and support for mammal conservation through education, communications and campaigns. So that's enough from me. I'm going to pass uh, over to uh, Susan, first of all, um, if I can access my control panel and stop sharing. So thank you and over to you, Susan. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, so I'm going to give you my thoughts on wildlife photography, uh, ethical wife, with just a short presentation. So if you've been looking at any reports on wildlife, you'll see that our wildlife is dwindling. And it does seem important that we should do our best to avoid any actions that could have adverse effects. And of course, wildlife photographers are not always aware of how their actions can affect wildlife. So part of what I'm saying in this webinar is to describe some of the protection already in place. 
So usually when you start doing wildlife photography, you have to be quite keen on wildlife. You have to be dedicated because, as you will know, there's a lot of time spent waiting to get that special shot. Now, just as an example, uh, with the one with the deer, I spent three mornings on the edge of a field where I'd seen roe deer from a distance, but without success of seeing them when I was there with my camera. However, on the fourth occasion, I waited several hours in a very cold and frosty morning, and I was about to leave when a deer family literally leapt into the field. So without persistence, I would not have been able to take this photograph and others of the family um, who were unaware of my presence. And those of you who are photographers will know just how much persistence and patience that you require. So some of that may actually ring bell with some of you. Sorry about that, technical problem there. So I'll go back to my, my dear picture. I, you may have heard me say it took a lot of persistence in order to get that photograph. And because some of you will be well aware of just how much persistence is required. So that may ring a bell with you. Um, so unfortunately, some photographers cut corners, sometimes doing things that break wildlife laws or disturb wildlife. That may be because they're not aware of the problems that they might cause. But at times, some wildlife photographers, unfortunately, are aware and getting the photograph means more than the well-being of their target species. I'm sure no one watching this is like that, or you wouldn't be watching this um, webinar, but I'm sure you will also have met some photographers who perhaps don't always use the right techniques. So there are wildlife laws uh, designed to protect our dwindling wildlife, and every wildlife photographer should be aware of them. So I've got a few of them on the screen here, the Wildlife and Countryside Act and the equivalent in Scotland, Protection of Badgers Act, Conservation of Habitat and Species Regulations. And although we are the Mammal Society, we can't really have a webinar about ethical wildlife photography without mentioning birds, which I will mention a little bit later. Now, the actual laws themselves make quite difficult reading, but if you use Google, you'll find more digestible summaries um, perhaps with uh, wildlife trusts, for example. So what I'm doing in this webinar is just giving some examples and some of the main points. So with regard to badgers, badgers do get quite a lot of bad press because of uh, surrounding TB concerns, though the opinions are somewhat divided about that, and it's not the thing I'm going to go into now, but it is an offence to disturb a badger set. Although badgers are mostly underground during the day, too much activity near the set entrance can disturb them. So the fence to disturb a badger when it's occupying a set, intentionally or recklessly damage, destroy or obstruct access to a badger set. Now, because not all badger sets are obvious. I mean, sometimes there's a very large hole in the ground and it's very obvious as a badger set. But this um, photograph here actually shows a badger set here underneath this rock. Now, you quite often see hollows under rocks, and it doesn't mean it's a badge set. But the other signs here are there's a well worn path here. There's a lot of loose soil here, which has been dug out of the hole. And though obviously you can't tell from the photograph, but there was a very strong smell of badger, which is quite unmistakable. So the badger clubs here, which I'm about to show you, they were filmed using a trail camera which was set up during daylight hours. So although you can get good still images from digital cameras, if you use uh, night vision camera systems, they can give good quality videos. And of course, the advantage is they can be set up during the day and left unattended for long periods. So this particular video, shall I put on, um, is of five young badger cubs. And this is the same rock, which I showed in the previous slide. It's just looked at from a different angle. And see, they all come out from under the rock and they don't stray, stray too far from the set because they're still quite young, young badgers. Now, otter holts are also protected. And otters are very difficult to find and to photograph. Um, and sometimes some wildlife photographers put uh, cameras in the actual halt. Now this halt here has got several large holes, which you can see. Some are higher than others. 
presumably so as the water levels rise and they can enter in through a different hole. So it is an offence to damage or destroy otter breeding sites and resting places with holes, even if otters are not present. And sometimes you might not be aware of what is a hold, but hopefully now that you're aware of this particular law, you'll be very careful. One has to be very careful near riverbanks anyway. It's not always obvious with support, but even if there aren't otters, you still have to leave them alone. <clears throat> so in coastal districts, which is where it's much easier to see otters, um, otters are out during the day. Now, coastal otters are the same as the river otters. Some people refer to them as sea otters, but of course the sea otter is a completely different species. So this was an otter photograph in the Shetland Isles. And one possible way to find otters is to go to where the otters are. And the commonest place you will find coastal otters is in the Shetland Islands. And many professional wildlife photographers, including those producing for the BBC, go to Shetland and they use the local guides to find otters for them. And these local guides, <clears throat> but certainly ones I've met, always use ethical wildlife practices. So you may not want to use guides, but this is what a lot of professional photographers do. And it is a very good way of finding rarer creatures. Otters are not that rare, but they're quite difficult to find and ensuring that you're not actually disturbing them. Wherever their holes might be. Oh, another thing to be aware of is the sensitivity of the animal and how to approach them. Now, with regard to otters, there are several things that you can do. Use binoculars. If you see them from a distance, and sometimes all, often all you see is a head poking up, use binoculars so you know where they are before you approach them. Approach so the wind is blowing towards you, which is possibly quite an obvious one. And you move closer when they die for fish. So a lot of time is spent down low, and then when the otter goes down, then you rush forward and then go down again. But it's not easy to find them. But as I say, if you do, you do have to be very careful how you approach them. Now, as far as coastal otters go, I'll go back. This is another coastal otter. This was on, on Mull. When they fish in the sea, there are a lot of problems that they encounter. The te sea temperature might be very low. The weather might be wild, there might be a lack of fish, and any disturbance can actually tip the balance away from survival. So they are certainly very sensitive. Now, as well as laws, you can, under the right conditions, photograph protected species, but licenses may be required. You get them from uh, Natural England. Um, and this particular one, is a dormouse. If I just show you the video, it's just a dormouse in a dormouse box. And you notice there's no nest in the box. Now, this um, video was from a project called the Woodland Trust. And the dormouse video is produced using an adapted box lid um, that I designed, which is sit on top of the box and able to film the dormouse without any disturbance. As you can see, the dormouse is behaving normally, so we were able to prove we were not disturbing them, and we were able to take these videos without needing a license. It is interesting that the camera was still present during a box check, and most dormouse boxes are, are checked several times in the year to see if dormouse are there. And the video actually shows, um, not this video, but another video, actually shows that the dormouse really test, tensed up when the box checkers were passing by. And it was very obvious that the, the dormouse was disturbed by the people walking past. So I think that demonstrates that normal box checks do disturb dormouse, which is why you require a license. But using a camera on the top doesn't disturb them. And so you can do that without needing a license. So as I said a bit earlier, although it's the Mammal Society, we have to say something about birds because so many wildlife photographers photograph birds, uh, mainly, I think, because there are a lot of birds and they're usually out during the day. Now, there's a special group of birds um, called Schedule 1 birds. It's a very long list. And this long list, is it contains birds such as barn owls, um, peregrines, kingfishers, and ospreys, in this case. Now, this photograph was taken in the Cairngorms, 
from a distance with a long lens. Uh, the osprey nest was on the top of a very tall tree on an island in a loch, and I stood under a tree some distance away on the loch shore to get the photographs, as I said, using a long lens. There was also a female in the nest, though you can't quite see it in this photograph. So the male brought fish, mated, perched on a tree for long periods, which demonstrated I was not disturbing them. But you don't always need a license, even for Schedule 1 birds and other sensitive creatures. And this is the government's advice. So I think it's actually better if we look at how you can avoid disturbance rather than just telling all the things that you mustn't do. So you don't need a license to survey, film or take photographs of protected birds or animals if you don't disturb them. And these are the ways which you can do. You can walk through habitats or photograph at a distance, which is what I did with the osprey. You can swallow trail cameras or other infrared cameras, which I did for the dormice boxes, or the old standard, you can use camouflage or hides, but they must be put up when the birds or animals are away from their nests. And if you're challenged, you may have to prove that you've not actually caused a disturbance. So even if birds aren't on the schedule one list, it's still good practice to avoid disturbing them as they may then leave an area which supports their well-being to an area that does not. Now, I recall some years ago, a very rare seabird um, came to Devon and over 3,000 photographers turned up, descended on the area with their cameras to photograph this poor bird. I think it survived, but it's not something that one would want to encourage, obviously. Something that I do now, less often I use um, cameras, digital still cameras left often, even though they can give you very high quality pictures. And instead I use night vision camera systems. Because these can be set up in advance for long periods. Um, this particular camera, which I'll show you in a second in the video in a minute, this was set up for about two months on Dartmoor in a small reservoir. And the idea was to film bats, which are actually very difficult to photograph because they are so fast moving, as you'll see from the video. So they fly very quickly and they're almost a blur. Now, this was taken with uh, actually security cameras. I use security cameras with infrared. And the actual little reservoir is at 70 meters wide. And all the light has been provided by the infrared LEDs on the camera. So there are ways that you can photograph even very difficult to photograph um, creatures, even creatures like bats, which are very heavily protected. Using this system, because you're not there, it's just the camera, infrared doesn't, doesn't actually bother them. So this is what I tend to use now. But whatever method you use for photography, there are always ways to take photographs without disturbing the wildlife. Um, okay, well, that's my bit, and I'll hand over to Danny. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, yeah, fascinating to think the, I think what, what that shows is that as a wildlife photographer, you know, we're sort of might be focused on getting that perfect image um, and, and photography as our main objective. But of course, if we're interacting with wildlife, we have to think about knowing enough about the wildlife that we're actually uh, seeking to photograph to be able to do it responsibly. Um, I think we get better results that way as well. So I think that's a really good uh, rule to, to consider. Okay, so without further ado, I'll pass over to you, Danny, if you're ready to share screen. I am, hopefully, yeah. Perfect. Okay, um, good morning, everyone. Why do I say good morning? Well, it's five o'clock for me and I'm in Mexico at the moment. So it was a bit tough waking up for this, um, but I am a wildlife photographer. I create videos on YouTube about my journey photographing uh, wildlife and my personal focus is mammals and red squirrels. And this is me and uh, a red squirrel last summer. Huh. Now, why does it not want me to change my slide? Hang on. Okay, that's working. <laughs> you, you can still see it? 
Yeah, that's all working, Danny. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, not sure what happened there. So I'm going to give a quick overview on some species I photographed in the UK. My approaches on how I photograph them based on their ecology and their behavior and why I did certain things um, because mammals are very sensitive. Some have very good um, sense of smell. Some have very good hearing. So I take different approaches based on the species and also based on where I am. Um, so you may have heard of the Royal Parks, uh, such as Richmond Park. That's quite an easy place to see and observe red deer where this photo was taken. Uh, one sunrise just before the rut was starting. And red deer as uh, in comparison to badgers are very easy to photograph in these Royal Parks. Um, and badgers are far more sensitive. Um, I'm going to talk about different uh, methods of photography that I use as well. Um, a lot of things I will mention, Susan has already mentioned. Um, so I'm going to elaborate a bit more on that. Um, so let's start with the first species, the red fox. Um, so I grew up in Southwest London where red foxes are very accessible and just on a short walk with my dogs, I can easily see around 10, 12. And the foxes are very curious of my dogs. So they will actually follow my dogs um, and my dogs are very well behaved. Um, but this is a, a young fox, uh, a few months old. And as you can see, it seems quite startled. The ears are right up looking straight at me. And I just managed to catch this as it was uh, walking through the gardens uh, in front of people's houses. Um, depending on where you are, red foxes can be very comfortable with people or very nervous. Um, in Sweden, they're extremely nervous. Uh, in London, especially some areas, you can get very close to them. And because they know you're there um, in, these, uh, in the cities, um, you can get quite close and they don't really display behaviors that are, well, they, they won't be nervous. If they're nervous, they leave. Um, so signs of, okay. <laughs> um, behavioral signs that show um, animals are relaxed, particularly mammals, is their ears will be back. They won't be looking at you. They'll be grooming, they'll be doing natural behaviors. Um, they'll be sleeping in front of you and any behaviors that seem relaxed mean they're comfortable with you. So this is a red fox that had a bit of a snooze in front of me. Although he's snoozing and closing his eyes, even though he's a few meters in front of me, he has still got those ears right up. So he is listening to me and watching what I'm doing. Next, I'm going to talk about red squirrels. Um, if you know my work, then you'll know that I do a lot of red squirrel photography. Um, this is a red squirrel from Anglesey. And the amazing thing about red squirrels, in my opinion, is that they're very adaptable. They learn very quickly and they're quite easy to photograph. Um, it does take some time patience, that's a critical thing in wildlife photography. And this squirrel, his name is Digit because of his broken finger. So I've been following him for four or five years. And at this point he knows me. So he actually does approach me. Um, I can make a whistle and he does recognize it. So a very different experience with red squirrels that I've had to other species, um, just because they are adaptable. Um, and when you can closely watch animals and they're comfortable with you, you start to really see natural behavior, which is amazing. So this is another red squirrel from um, Northern Sweden collecting uh, a spruce cone. And it's amazing when you're able to watch their natural behavior because it's so much more interesting to photograph them when they're doing their own thing rather than when they're very alert and staring at you. 
Um, so I've been able to document red squirrels collecting nesting material and I was directly underneath this red squirrel and they collect lichen to build up their drays. Um, and this is quite a unique image. And if it wasn't for the fact that I'd spent a lot of time observing these animals, understanding where they are in the forest and how they behave, I wouldn't have been able to get this photo. Something I like to do is use camera traps. And over the years, I've really realized how adaptive squirrels are and how quickly they learn. So I built two jumping platforms, which is actually how I took the photo behind me. So I had two platforms and on one side, I had a very small amount of food such as hazelnuts and a few almonds and walnuts. So high quality food, not um, sunflower seeds or bread. So I all, if I do bait, I always use just a little bit and I make sure it's high quality. Um, I only bait with very small animals, for example, like red squirrels. Baiting is a big topic in wildlife photography at the moment. Um, and there's definitely a change in views. Um, one thing I really like to do with red squirrels is actually sprinkle the food in the forest. So it does encourage natural foraging behavior. And one thing I have discovered with red squirrels is that they will never eat themselves fat. <laughs> they will always cash if they have too much food. Um, so squirrels to survive winter, they will gain 20, well, up to 20% of their body weight in autumn to survive winter. And they will have a lot of food stored uh, in the ground or in the trees where they will cache food. So just going back to how I took this photo, I had two jumping perches and the squirrels could jump between. And I let the squirrels explore the perches two weeks before I even had a camera and attempted any photographs. So it was for them to work out. And if you've seen videos online of gray squirrels in America, they are very curious and they really like a challenge. And I found that as well with the red squirrels. Okay, that's enough red squirrels. <laughs> Um, now, Red Deer, as I said, Royal Parks are a great place to watch deer that are mostly comfortable with people, but of course you still have to keep your distance. Um, I often go to Richmond Park and I do use a long lens um, almost all of the time. So I use a focal length between 300 millimeter and 600 millimeter and one of the best spectacles in um, the animal kingdom, I think is the red deer rut. So the, the stags will roar and bellow um, as they uh, bring females together for the mating season. Um, but it's really important during the rut to um, keep your distance. The deer will come to you. They will walk between people. So you can get photos quite close. But my personal recommendation with the rut is don't go on the weekends because there will be a lot of photographers and it's always better to be with on your own or with just a few photographers because uh, in the Royal Parks, especially in London, there can be 60 to 80 photographers one morning. So I always avoid the weekends if you can. Next species is the badger. So badgers are, I mean, it, just look at it what um, body parts are enlarged and what are small. It's got very small eyes, big ears and a big nose. And that reflects in its ecology. So they actually have quite poor vision, which means you can get quite close to them. But it's very important that you're downwind. The perfect conditions are no wind or that you're in a place where the badger um, the wind is behind the badger coming towards you. Um, and that means the badger won't smell you. Um, they have got sensitive hearing. So if you're quiet and you're positioned low, you can get close to them and they will be comfortable just foraging in front of you. This badger may have heard me. So he's come right up and he's having, he's putting his ears right up so he can have a good look. And he did pause for a moment um, 
but then he was comfortable just foraging again. I have discovered that badgers are very relaxed with flashes. So this is a camera trap I set up where badgers would cross the river on this amazing fallen log. And I had my camera in the river with a motion sensor. Motion sensor. I use the cam traption sensor. So when the badger moves in front of, or any animal moves in front of the sensor, it tells the camera to take a photo. And I have two flashes on a very low setting. So just a bit of, um, to have two, I diffuse them with some, uh, like a soft box. And this adds a, a, a soft amount of light. Um, and then I had a long, um, relatively long exposure to get a bit of the uh, water. Next species is gray seals. Um, they are um, lovely to photograph. And when you do have the opportunity to observe them from a distance, it can be really amazing. Um, there are several beaches in the UK where you have um, several hundreds that group onto um, the sand. And um, this photograph, I was just um, in a, I guess a small trench. So I was quite low and I just had my lens um, over the sand, um, but it did take me, I would say about 40 minutes to get down to that level. And I took my time, I was very slow and I watched how the whole colon colony behaved because if they do get startled, you will have the whole group go into the sea. And I have observed this with people walking their dogs too close to seals. Um, so I always take my time with seals and go very slowly. Um, and these are two males um, just sensing each other, but it looks like they're having a kiss. Um, some more kissing, very romantic. Um, something very popular to photograph is the gray seal pups. Um, because they are born quite underdeveloped with this thick winter coat or a thick um, coat, they stay on land for four to six weeks before going out to the sea. And their mother will come to feed them a few times a day, but they are left alone on the beach. Um, the pups are usually quite relaxed around people, and that's not a good thing. For these shots, I was at 600 millimeter with a crop sensor. So it was actually around 800 millimeter, which is probably around 20 meters away. Um, and I would only go to, um, I would only spend around 10 minutes with each pup. Um, and this one had realized I was there, um, but then he was very comfortable. Um, so I, try to be very quick with seal pups, but I do take a long time to approach them. So I like to be low. And one thing I've really discovered with um, gray seals is that their vision isn't great, but they do have, uh, they do see contrast very well. So if you're stood up against a skyline, they will see you immediately. So they see silhouettes very easily. So what I like to do is I crawl on my belly for 10, maybe up to 40 minutes, just approaching um, the seal pups. And they do behave uh, naturally very quickly. So they become quite comfortable. Um, and just behind this pup was, a, was the, the mother. Um, and as you can see, this is natural behavior, very comfortable. Um, and then this is a mother and a uh, pup together. And if the mother is comfortable with me, then the pup is. Um, I think with photographing seal pups, the most amazing moment you can have is when the mother approaches to feed her pup and then leaves. And that shows that she's she knows you're there, but she's not disturbed by your presence. Seal pups um, 
are very sensitive. So um, there are only a few places in the UK you can go to them, um, but there are places where you can be uh, with um, a volunteer from a, a safe distance and you can watch them uh, with binoculars or a long lens. Next species is otters. And as Susan mentioned, one of the best places to go is Shetland. And I went for a week with a professional guide. Um, so the amazing thing with going with a guide is they will know families, they will know certain individuals and they know where their halts are and they know how to be safe and careful. Similarly to the um, uh, badgers and even gray seals, they have very small eyes. So their vision isn't actually that good, but they have an excellent sense of smell and very good hearing. So whenever I was trying to photograph otters, we made sure that we were wherever we were on the coast, we would be downwind. So the, the wind from the sea um, was not going directly towards us. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. Um, so the scent, so the, the basically the scent of us would not go to the otter because if they do smell you, they will vanish immediately and that will be it. Obviously, you don't want to disturb any species when photographing them, um, but then you're going to miss your photo. And yeah, it's it's not um, pleasant to disturb an animal. Um, you always want to photograph the most um, relaxed and natural behavior, um, and you'll want to do it for the species. So this is um, actually a bundle of uh, three otters. Um, the one you can see is a, a, a pup and then it's leaning on its mother and then the other pup is behind. And we spent three hours um, slowly getting closer to this family and they were sitting and sleeping for that entire time. And we were hoping that they would start playing or um, move a bit closer into the, towards land, but they didn't. And we managed to escape or not escape we managed to move away um it took time but we moved away and the otters were still there and that's the amazing thing is being able to approach uh, a sensitive animal it's left there and it doesn't know your presence at all um so we we were hoping to get better photos but of course the amazing thing was just to watch them to hear them and to watch completely wild animals that don't know you're there. And because they don't know we're there, they start playing. So these were two pups playing and play fighting just in front of us. And the halt was about 10 meters on the left and mum was in there um, and the pups were going to follow, um, but it's amazing to watch them um, yeah, natural behavior. It's on, honestly the most amazing thing to watch wild animals do their thing and they don't know you're there. Um, because then you can watch things like watch them hunt. And that's something I've never really observed before with other species. Um, so their mum comes in with an octopus and the pup is following. And this, this pup was already, I think, eight months old at the time. Um, and they stay with mum until they're a year, a year and a half. Um, I'll just play it again. But as you can see, the, the mother has her uh, nostrils flared. So she's, she's alert. She's trying to sniff around. Um, because the waves and the wind is quite loud um, and we're sitting, we're comfortable. We're not making noise, but she is still looking around. And it gives the impression that she can um, see us, but she can't. Um, so Shetland is a great place to photograph otters and um, you can uh, go with, there's many guides and I always, for sensitive subjects, if you can go with a guide, I totally recommend it because you can learn from a professional who knows what they're doing and is the most ethical um, for that species. Um, I'm going to go to non-UK just um, 
for a moment. Um, this uh, is a musk ox that I photographed in Norway. Um, and for large animals, you have to be careful for your own safety, um, not just for the safety of the animal. Um, so large herbivores, uh, especially those that um, are, they live in herds, you don't want to get too close to a position that you're going to cause a stampede or something or a false uh, stampede. Um, so for this, I knew that they were um, not a dangerous animal, but an animal that I didn't know much about and that I wanted to learn from someone who knew exactly what they're doing. So I did go with a guide and um, he allowed us to be safe and keep the animal safe. Um, and we actually got quite close to this individual only because there was a river between us. Um, so the other individuals, um, they were quite far and he said, this is a good distance, but we were able to see and observe this young male because we had a river. Um, something I didn't mention and I'll mention it quite quickly is hides. There are various hides. Uh, in the UK and Europe and across the world where you can photograph um, animals uh, from a basically a box. Some animals know you're there, some don't. There are red squirrel hides which are quite open um, so you're, you can move and make noise and speak within the hide and the squirrels aren't uh, fussed but that's because I think red squirrels are quite um, relaxed with time with people but there are certain hides, uh, for example, there's lynx hides in Spain and those you have to be very quiet. And um, the point of those is that the animal doesn't know you're there. Um, so there are different uh, methods for photographing mammals. Um, but I always think, is this putting the animal in, in danger in any form? Um, and if not, then I don't bother. Um, as I said, I avoid royal parks on the weekend. I don't like to be with lots of people, photographers, because it does um, stress the animals. They might be um, okay with your presence, but they will be uh, higher alert. And I don't want to uh, cause, or I want to cause minimal disturbance. Obviously being there, um, animals will, well, based on the species, if they know you're there, then they will react slightly different than if they were completely on their own. Um, and this baby squirrel was one that I um, helped to adulthood. Um, his mother got hit by a car and the only, and I was basically helping uh, with supplementing food um, for him and his three siblings. And I was able to get very close to baby squirrels um, in the wild. And that wouldn't have been possible for those unfortunate events. Um, but I always would sit down and wait for the baby squirrels to approach me. And when they reached sexual maturity, I basically spent less and less time in the forest so that I could distance myself from the animals. Um, but yeah. I hope that's been useful. There's a lot to talk about, about ethics. Um, and I think it's a quickly evolving subject, especially with wildlife photography. Um, so yeah, I think that's all. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Danny. Um, and I'm going to just uh, say a few things in addition. And while I'm doing that, please do get your questions in. We've got a few already that we'll work through uh, very shortly. Um, but first of all, just a huge thank you to both Susan and Danny for those uh, you know, really great insights um, and uh, lovely photos shared as well as examples of what's possible um, with an ethical practice. Um, before I go into questions, I just wanted to make a few announcements. The first is um, as part of our Mammal Week activity, uh, we are currently running a, a book giveaway on Instagram with our partners at Pelagic Publishing. Um, and that includes uh, Susan's uh, wonderful book, The Wildlife Photography Fieldcraft Guide. Um, so please do uh, pop onto Instagram if you've got an account um, and follow those instructions um, or, or just go to the Mammal Society page for those instructions um, and uh, you could be in with a chance of uh, winning your own copy. 
um, and it's a highly recommended book um, in, in any case. Of course, in this uh, webinar, we've been kind of looking over overall at the principles with a few examples, but depending on what species you're looking to photograph um, and, and what habitats you're working within, uh, that's when it starts to get really specific. So it's great to, to have a guide like this. Um, also wanted to make uh, an announcement, um, which is that the Mammal Photographer of the Year um, competition for, uh, for 2024 is opening today um, in line with our Mammal Week focus on wildlife photography. Um, so please do consider entering um, with your photos taken um, within uh, the year leading up to April uh, 2024. Um, the theme this year is mammal connections in line with uh, with this week this uh, uh, mammal week's theme. So looking at how mammals are connected um, to other uh, wildlife in the ecosystem and to ourselves. Um, so some of the winners from last year's uh, competition are up on the screen there when the connection was um, with uh, mammals through the seasons. Um, when you go to Mammal Photographer of the Year uh, competition um, website, uh, you'll also see that we've really um, emphasized the ethical photography uh, principles this year. Um, and so there's some really good guidelines that are actually included on the website uh, that can give you some pointers um, that back up some of what you've heard today um, and also go uh, into some areas that we haven't discussed so far, uh, such as around your captioning, um, and the release of information um, about wildlife that you might um, have encountered um, through going um, into, um, into those habitats to take photographs. Um, so those principles are, are a really good reference point if you're planning to enter Mammal Photographer of the Year uh, competition um, or beyond. Um, and I've noticed recently uh, the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Awards um, has uh, the results from this year's competition have just gone live. Uh, and it reminded me, it prompted me to look back at some of the, the winners from previous years. Um, and uh, I just couldn't find uh, a year when a UK mammal um, was given that prominence as, as the winner of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year Award um, and a very little UK wildlife all round, which might be a bit of an insight into um, how nature impoverished we have, uh, we are in the UK. But I think it's also a reflection with mammals in particular of how elusive they are and uh, how difficult it can be to get that perfect photograph. And I think that does sometimes provide wildlife photographers with that temptation um, to cut corners, as Susan said, um, and to and to look for ways uh, to get the insight that isn't very easy to come by. Um, but patience seems to be the defining um, characteristic of ethical photography from both Susan and Danny's talk. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pass over to the question panel um, and uh, I'm going to go through um, in order of, of which ones have been upvoted. Um, so again, if, if you've asked a question um, and uh, or other, if you want to ask a question, but you see someone else has already asked, asked it, just upvote their question just to make sure we prioritise uh, the ones that people most want to hear. Uh, so the first question is from Chris uh, to you, Susan. Um, so what's the difference, if any, between a security camera and a trail camera? Uh, uh, Chris is currently using a series of trail cameras to observe the lives of wild boar and other animals that regularly come into his orchard and garden. Um, but uh, could you advise maybe on a different approach to that, a different type of automatic camera? Okay. Well, trail cameras are sort of all in one boxes, if you like. They have the camera. There's also a recorder inside and you put in the batteries. So they're quite small. They're very good. During the day, not quite so good at night. As a rule, the image is, can be a bit grainy and quite often is very short, simply to conserve battery strength. Um, with regard to the cameras I use, they are really CCTV cameras, but I try not to use the term CCTV now because people have a slightly different opinion of that. They get a slightly different idea of what they are. So it's um, a separate camera, a separate recorder, and if you're out, obviously outside where there's no mains power, you have a battery as well. Uh, and there will, in fact, be a webinar on a course, rather, on using those uh, next year, early next year with the Mammal Society. But as far as um, giving ideas, if you can somehow give us your email address, then I can um, send you some details of the sorts of cameras that you might want to use. Not quite as straightforward, but once you get the idea, um, the, the big advantage is you can leave them out for longer because you can have a bigger battery 
And there also are a lot of features in the recorders that you don't get with trail cameras uh, with regard to motion detection, um, with regard to timing the scheduling and something called pre-record, which you don't have with trail cameras. Pre-record means the recorder keeps a little bit in a buffer so that um, once recording is triggered, it always takes even a second or half a second with a trail camera, you lose that first second or so of footage. But if with pre-record, there's a bit waiting for you in the buffer, so that's stuck on the end of the video, sorry, beginning of the video, beg your pardon, uh, and that way you don't miss any action. So I'm, I'm very keen on them. I've been pushing them for quite a long time, and I think that's the way forward. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. And yes, as Susan mentions, we will be running a, a more in-depth uh, training in the use of those techniques, um, so please do look out for our training programme uh, next year. We also hope to uh, to do more on ethical wildlife photography uh, that we can do in, in a one-hour session. Um, uh, I was going to reflect on that as well, just to say that I, what I find really fantastic about that kind of use of, of CCTV arrays um, is the fact that you get that insight that could then, well, from a, a biology perspective, from a biological records perspective, we get all the information we need. But if you are looking to take, you know, to more sort of artistic photographs with an SLR camera, you can use those techniques to get the insight into the behavior in that ecosystem and the movements of wildlife that can allow you to then take a considered approach about the way you set up to get those shots that you want. Because um, we've heard it's uh, it's about avoiding disturbance and doing your research um, to, to really make sure that you can do that. So I think they're really fantastic techniques to, uh, to, to bring into your toolkit. Um, I've got uh, a question for Danny uh, from Jen. Uh, so Danny, wonderful photos. Um, although they are a different species, out of curiosity, have you ever photographed red squirrels in North America? And if so, did you have to alter your methods? So if I can broaden that to, you know, do you find you have to take different approaches uh, if, you, if you are photographing species in, in different uh, countries where the conditions and the species might be slightly different? Um, I find specifically with squirrels that it doesn't matter what species they are, they they have similar, very similar characteristics. Um, so all arboreal squirrels, um, I mean, I've been photographing Mexican gray squirrels recently, and they have very similar behaviors to the red squirrels in Sweden or red squirrels in UK. Um, so I don't really change my approach. Um, I, I change my approach based on the species um, so my approach for a squirrel will be very different to an otter or a fox. Um, so, um, and I've not photographed red squirrels in North America, so I can't answer that. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Danny. I think one of the things that sometimes does differ with um, photographing any species in the UK is that we are, unfortunately, you know, quite lacking uh, in... Um, in wildlife habitat, particularly publicly accessible wildlife habitat. And so there is often more pressure on those uh, habitats um, from those that want to take those photographs. So I think one of the things that I think you get more of a luxury of uh, photographing in Europe or, or North America is that you can go somewhere which is not too you know, bombed by photographers, even though it's a great place to photograph those species. Um, and here, um, I think some of the uh, the, the sort of cautions that that both Danny and Susan have given about, you know, harassing the wildlife to get that perfect photo. Um, you do have to consider, it's not just you, you have to consider the wider picture of how much um, uh, photographers uh, and public and tourists and so on might be might be putting pressure on um, wildlife on a particular, particular coastline. Um, I've got a, a photograph, uh, sorry, a question from an anonymous attendee. Um, I'm just starting to get into wildlife photography in Devon and Cornwall. Do you have any tips and tricks, please, uh, particularly around keeping the cost down with equipment and still getting great photos? <clears throat> I'll go ask Danny. Oh, sorry, Susan, you, you go in first. <laughs> oh, me? Right, OK. Well, of course, I have to mention my book, not I? Just quickly. Oh, it's blurred. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> I'll put it in the chat as well, Susan. No, I don't. Is it mirror finished? No, that's right. Oh, it's OK. It's, you can see it. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it. Well, that's my book's really more about how you find wildlife. It's not so much about the photography. Um, but I think if you're doing small things like birds, for example, you do need a long lens and they're expensive. But larger animals, you can use uh, a cheaper lens, a uh, shorter lens. Um, 
and they do cost less. But there are a lot of cameras available and you don't always need the top of the range. Even the cheap cameras, relatively cheap, can get very good photographs. Um, so I think if you start, you get to, don't spend a lot of money, just get quite a cheap camera, even if it's in a compact camera. Um, but even um, digital cameras, SLRs, are relatively, you can get relatively cheap ones with a lens and just start slowly, perhaps going to parks, even going to zoos. There's not, no harm in going to zoos or wildlife. There are some wildlife photography places which have UK wildlife. And then once you, you think it's really for you, then perhaps you can spend a little bit more just to get slightly higher quality. But you still can get very good cameras, very good photographs, even with relatively cheap cameras. Yeah, I would just add to that that um, there's a lot of um, companies in the UK, uh, MPB park cameras that sell uh, used secondhand equipment and they actually class like how used it is. Um, so the price will be based on how used it is. So you can almost buy brand new or um, a lens that is uh, older, um, but it still will work the same and you can, uh, you know, get a cheaper lens um, um, that's a very good lens. Um, uh, I think a zoom lens to begin with is a great option, something that's like uh, 100 millimeters to 300, 500 millimeters. Um, and that can enable you to get um, very close, um, close, not uh, physically, but uh, with, with your camera, um, or you can zoom out. Um, so there are, there are various options. I personally don't buy, uh, from like eBay, um, but there's, um, those websites I mentioned, they can even, uh, offer warranty. Um, um, so if something happens, they, they can help you. Uh, and that's more assuring when, you know, investing into camera equipment. Thanks so much to both of you. We're going to have to call time now. Um, although that we didn't get through all the questions, apologies. Um, I was just going to say to, to Dawn on the DSLR trap photography, that's not currently in our um, in our programme, but it sounds like if there's demand, that could be something we could look at for sure. So we'll we'll take that on board. And, and Sorry, and just to add, I have a 20 minute YouTube video all about that. Oh, perfect. Uh, and it includes <laughs> ethics and trail cameras. So um, brilliant. Well, if you yeah. could uh, start there, then everyone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sounds <laughs> ideal. Um, Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I was just going to add on to that last question as well about uh, the affordability of wildlife photography, because that is a real concern for others. So I'll, I'll back up what um, Danny and Susan both said, uh, it, that it's, you know, if you prioritise what you need to get the photos over, you know, it's the newest camera and so on, then you can work with some fairly um, old equipment. But if you've got the long lens, you can get that, to get those results. Um, and uh, I'll also say that there are some really good hire companies out there. There's some which um, you can hire a, a long lens, which you'd never be able to afford uh, for a weekend uh, when you're, you know, you're going to be going out. Because a lot of the time, you, if you, if you're an amateur wildlife photographer, you, you could, you could spend thousands on getting a really good kit, and then it will be spending most of its time hung up in your boot room, <laughs> not being used. So um, if you can either uh, hire. For a particular holiday or for a particular um, excursion um, or maybe even pool equipment with a number of other photographers um, uh, so that you're kind of sharing um, uh, one set of kits and, and taking it out when you need to. That's a, a really good way to uh, to make the most of it. Um, so I'm going to finish just by saying a huge thank you to both of our speakers and to all of you for joining us today. Um, and just uh, if I can, oh, sharing screens causing problems. Um, just highlight um, on top of the things that I said just before questions. Um, so we're just getting to the end of Mammal Week, but it is still Mammal Week until Sunday. If you're uh, thinking about uh, the content of this webinar or anything else to do with mammal conservation and science, please do post with the hashtag Mammal Connections. Um, and particularly over the weekend, we'll be celebrating all of the local work that people are doing uh, to monitor and protect mammals in their local areas through our local groups or as individuals. So if you've got any stories to tell, any projects to highlight, please do get involved. Um, if you don't already have Mammal Mapper on your phone, please do download it. It's a free app. It just means that if you're out there, either because you know you're going to see a species or because um, you're going out to see what you find and you, and you have a fantastic experience um, and manage to capture um, uh, a mammal, no matter how good your photos are, uh, we want the record. So we want that biological record so that we can um, build up that picture 
of how our mammal populations are doing. It's a really great way that you can help uh, science and conservation uh, while out with your camera. Um, at the moment, some issues uh, are being encountered by people with the newest Android phones. That will be fixed soon enough. So if you do have problems installing, just come back in a couple of weeks. Um, and finally, if uh, you've enjoyed this free webinar, we'd love uh, any support you can offer uh, to help us continue to keep um, this uh, free webinar series going um, and also all of our other work to protect and support mammals across the UK. Uh, there's a really easy way you can just donate a fiver there by uh, texting mammals to 70450. Um, but if you'd like to become a Mammal Society member, you'll get uh, reduced rates on all of our training, including the training in these subjects next year. Um, and you'll make the money back on your membership fee pretty much straight away if you start to, to use any of our training programs. So I'll leave it there and just say a huge thank you to everyone and enjoy the rest of your day, or in Danny's case, enjoy the start of your day. <laughs> thank you for joining us so early, Danny. <laughs> Go back to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to bed, that's the other option for all of us. Thanks everyone and uh, have a lovely weekend. Thank you.